And here we are. Um, we're sideways. Oh, we're sideways. There we are. All right. That was a turn for the better, right? Um, let's think a little bit about um, sort of drawing some, some uh, winter landscape ethos. Um, landscape ethos are landscape drawings, but just writ small. Um, if I am uh, making a landscape and I make that landscape in a box this is, that is this big, I can get a ton of information in here. And because it's small, I'm going to restrict myself from endlessly putting in detail. And the result of this is that I can fill, make a bunch of these little landscape drawings in a short period of time. If I double the size of this, so make it twice as high and twice as long, so I've doubled its size, I have just quadrupled the amount of work that I have to do because the amount of work that I now have to do goes up by the square, right? So if I've doubled the size, I have four times as much work. And then you get into the problem of I'm sick of drawing trees, right? You get in there, you draw, by the time you're drawing your 50th tree, you're like, ah, I don't know if drawing landscapes is for me. But with a landscape eat though, right? Boom, boom, boom. You're going to be, um, in your happy place. Um, I'm going to switch over microphones to. So just audio check. Can I be clear, uh, heard clearly? Yes. Great. All right. So with a little winter landscape pito, um, the things that are going to make your landscape pito really pop are first just keeping it small. And the second is just thinking about value in a really simple way. Value is lights and darks. And if I am, if I am, if I concentrate on that and I focus on that, I'll have probably a successful landscape pito. What I do is I usually think of my drawing as three different steps in value. I, part of it will be dark. Part of it will be a middle value. And part of it will be just left white. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, at the end of my drawing, I'm going to look at is most of my drawing middle value and light? Or is most of my drawing dark value and middle value? Right. Whatever it is most of, this is, this is the new trick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just put in one other value step between those two. So if it's mostly these sort of lighter middle to light, I can probably have room to put in another little value step in there. Or if it's mostly dark things, I can kind of make that a little bit more nuanced by having a sort of middle shade in there. So that is, if there's a whole bunch of my thing that is this middle value, I can get on a little bit more nuance in there that way. So let me show you how this works, um, drawing a little snowy forested scene. All right, so you are out in the field and you're looking out at, there's a conifer forest and um, there is, uh, I'm going to have, a line of distant trees coming out here um, and some distant forest in the background and maybe a little bit of mountains. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is make this kind of a, uh, a, a, a forested landscape. So for my, my, my first, I'm going to have these conifers down here. I'm going to show you my kind of quick conifer forest drawing trick. What I do is as I'm, I'm going to make a little kind of line here that is kind of jiggly jaggly, broken line that um, is going to be the edge of my, 
my conifer forest. Let's zoom down on that. Now notice this is really big on your screen, but here's the size of my thumb, right? So I'm not making this too big. It's a thumbnail picture. Um, I'm gonna have a few other little trees out here at the edge of this. And um, this is going to be my, I'm gonna put this all in as medium value. Because I have a rather dull, blunt pencil, see one stroke of my pencil is that thick. I can very quickly make an area of tone. If I want this to kind of feel more sort of coming down to a snowy edge here, I'm gonna sort of smooth that edge in. And then, <clears throat> um, let's see, I'm thinking that this is gonna be snow fields out here. So I'm just going to, there's some snow fields, I've got my dark. Um, I have another line of trees back here. I'm just gonna put in a line of little vertical marks back there. That's my distant trees. And then I'm going to pick up for these hills, these mountains in the background. A little middle value. So very, very simple. Um, I'm going to now pick a, so I've got dark, medium, and white. Um, and I'm now gonna pick some uh, either one little extra dark or one little medium thing here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna punch in one more value here. And that is, I think I'm gonna make, I think this value of dark that I have isn't really as dark as I can go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I've got this value, this value, and this value. I'm gonna put in a little bit of this value here, this is up close. So now third value. Uh, watch, this is kind of cool. I'm going to make just a few little downward squiggles that end in sharp points, these little downward pointing V. You see what I just did? Now, um, Vea, tell me to, I'm going to be moving my pencil around here and I want you to say at a certain point, just say stop. Stop. All right. I'm going to put down another one right where Vea said stop. And you see what that's done? It's carved a little tree right there. Now tell me to stop again. Stop. All right, gonna come down here. This one starts broader and comes down to about there. So what I'm doing is I'm really putting these in very randomly. Not all the same depth, some bigger, some shorter. And what you get is this sort of sense of, oh, look at this, these one, two, three, four trees, all the same size. You know how I hate that kind of symmetry. Ugh. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make one of these trees, this one right here, a little bit shorter. There we go. Symmetry gone. And then that feels like there's this forest out there that fast. So by leaving this white, that suggests that, you know, we're here in forest. Now, how can you tell that that's that? What if that is a lake? What if that is snow? How do you determine that? <clears throat> you can do that several ways. You can go like this. I write the word snow and I point a line to it. Now what happens is everybody looks at that and they see the word snow, they associate this with snow, that then becomes snow in your brain, right? If I wrote still lake, right? Then you would read that as a still lake. So I'm telling the person what to think, right? 
and or telling myself at some point in the future. Um, another way of handling that is just with color. In order to make that a lake with, uh, I'm just going to add a little bit of, of color to this. I'm going to add some blue into the sky. And then I'm going to put in some blue, a darker shade of blue on that distant mountain range. And just a hint of some green in here. not too much. And now it's snow again. Because there's blue in the sky and there's not blue on the water, we look at that and your brain goes snow. And another thing that really makes it feel like snow is that the darkness of my trees is really dark. So it feels like bright snow because it's next to, um, it's next to, uh, these dark trees. So that contrast, that contrast is what makes it feel like bright snow. If those were kind of pale trees in there, eh, it wouldn't really feel so much like snow. So now let's take a walk from here. Oh, there's even some willow trees that are sticking up through the middle of that snowy field. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in just a few little some clumps of willow, like I might see out in Hope Valley, where I hope to go explore again. Um, or maybe there is that fence line that goes across the meadow. That then gives you, there's a little bit more depth up in the front. A little bit, it gives you just sort of more of a sense of kind of going back to that meadow. But that happened really fast because it's small. If I had made this big, this big, I would still be trying to figure out like how to noodle in the shapes of trees. But I can get in this very, very kind of look. These are trees. And by the way, just a note on that little tree line. I didn't do this. Nope, I did not. It was a jiggle like this. Like a bad EKG. You want it regularly irregular not like shark teeth. And you can also do this every once in a while. You can go in and just take one of those tips, make it a little bit taller, and put some kind of careful tree top on it. Now people see that one little careful tree top and they go like, oh, look, those are all trees. So <clears throat> all you have to do is suggest something in a landscape ito, and the viewer's brain is going to take it from there. Let's now go inside that forest. There's still snow on the ground but there are trees all around us. Um, and so we're gonna do just another little landscapito. Something that's fun to do 
is to make yourself a little landscapito collage. So in one place, you can make multiple little frames and you can kind of put those out in a grid or you can sometimes just sort of imagine that there is, there's a little, these are little kind of snapshots that you've taken and you can even overlap them in all sorts of kind of fun wonky ways. So I might put my next one there. I might have my next one after that be, let me zoom back. All right, so I might have the next one be here. So that these two are aligned. But for this next one here, I'm going to put this one down at just a kind of a funny little angle like this. We're going to walk into that forest and draw from inside the trees. And then we're going to kind of get out and kind of look at some, um, some marshland. A little bit of snow on it, but the marshland is also going to have a bunch of cattails and things that are po poking, poking out. And so you'll see these sort of masses of of, of, of cattails <clears throat> going out across, as you might find in Sierra Valley. Whoop. Maybe back out a little bit. There we go. All right, so again, here's my thumb. This is a small picture. Um, what I've got is um, so you've walked into the forest, you found a little coyote trail going through the snow, and um, there is uh, there are these uh, these bases of these 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 coniferous trees coming down these trunks of these trees all around you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it simple. We're up there in the forest, so this tree, the base of it, is down below our feet. And then further back here, there's another tree, but we see the base of that tree right about there. Um, going back further in the snow. So notice what I'm doing as these trees are coming down lower in the picture, those are ones that are closer to you. So if I want to get a sense of kind of space in that forest, I want to have the tree trunks ending at different heights. This one is the closest to me, then this one. As I go up the page, I hit this one, it's the next, this is the next highest one, this is the next furthest back, this one then, then this one, and this one. And then there's going to be kind of a zone back here where... All right, that's going to be where you're, there's a little kind of hill and we go up and we're looking down on the other side of that. So um, keeping my values very, very simple here. And oh, watch this. I am right-handed. So the danger is, I'm going to see if you can see this. Seal that graphite on my hand. What's happening is as I'm drawing here, I am rubbing my hand all over this little landscape drawing. If I don't want that to happen, um, I can either do my drawing with a ballpoint pen, which is a great sketching tool. It's not going to really do that unless it's an old blotchy pen. Um, another thing I can do is I'm just going to take a piece of paper and put it down over that part of the drawing so that as I am drawing, I'm not going to be rubbing all over that. All right, so here we go. Um, I have tree number one. And it's okay for me to change the angle of my kind of shading lines in here. What I'm doing, I'm making a bunch in one direction, then sort of changing. It makes it a little bit blotchy and kind of chunky in the shading on that tree. Here's another one. This one I maybe will just go. I'm 
and putting in the darks against this stark white. Actually, on this, these ones back here, I think I'm going to do something kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do is, yeah, yeah, this will be kind of a neat little lesson. I'm actually going to come in here and on this, the top parts of these trees here, I'm going to erase it a little bit. The reason that I'm going to erase those, I'm going to erase this one a little bit on the side here and a little bit on its side here. The reason that I'm doing this is that in the back there, that's where you've got over a little hill and there's going to be forest back there that's really dark. And so what I'm going to do is have my trees back there be light against dark. And when they're close down here on the snow, they'll be dark against light. So light against dark and dark against light. So I'm showing where those trees are by So you see how you're going up this tree and at a certain point, I'm seeing the tree because it's light. Then here I'm seeing the tree because it's dark. And again, that dark is really going to make the woods feel darker and deeper. This is a little bit too abrupt here, so I'm going to put a little bit of shading in there. I want this to be subtle. There we go. Now, um, these trees have branches on them. And so trees often have, so we've got some branches that are coming down out of these trees. This one here is going to come out like that. And I'm going to have another branch. It's going to cut across this one. The advantage of being out in nature is there would be a real forest with real trees, and you could sort of see, like, oh, what angle am I make? Do I make my branches kind of stick down? Do I make them stick out? Um, you'd actually have real branches there. Um, and if there's piles of snow on some of these, I'm just going to kind of maybe wad that up. Ooh, I can use my little, this eraser that I'm using, by the way, this is kind of a fun little tool here. This skinny eraser, it's called the Mono Zero. And I'm able to come in and just take out some very specific Now I'm going to punch a little bit more value in the middle of this tree. And if this is an overcast day, then what you'd get is just sort of stuff in the background is a little bit grayer. But I'm not going to put in so much shading back there that it really sort of makes this feel like you are um, uh, that, that it's that it's gray. I want it to, to, to remain white. If it's a sunny day, the sun is kind of getting through and there will be shadows cast across the snow here. And so we'll we'll see on how we can kind of play with that. Uh, first, I'm going to pile some snow up against some of the bases of some of these trees. Let's say the sunlight is coming from this direction. That means any shadow is going to be kind of cast out. The, the 
shadow from a tree that is off the screen here. And I could leave this as a graphite drawing, or if I wanted to, it's a very easy watercolor then because my values are already established. And all I'm really going to do is, I think I might just kind of bring some color into the snow in these shadows here, just kind of make those, kind of blue those up a little bit. In the background, that's going to stay dark. So I just want to really make sure that a little bit of dark watercolor in there. Put down my pencil so thickly, it's even kind of beating up on the paper. But that keeps those woods lovely, dark, and deep. <clears throat> and I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. Little hint of some dark on these, some color on these trees. And forest is done. So zooming out, just it is another reason to do small drawings on winter days is your fingers don't get as cold. Um, let's bop on down to the marshland there, um, because all the cattails have, um, there's a, a lot of the, the marsh is covered with, with uh, ice. Um, there are cattails that are sticking up that the wind has blown the, where you still sort of see them sticking up and they're brown, colors of brown against um, and then there's the there's sort of areas of, of, of open ice. Um, so that might be kind of fun to do. Um, you know, some things, let, let, let's say there, there were little, if the stuff had started to melt and on these trees here, somebody was asking earlier about, you know, just there's 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 ice collecting on on these 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 trees. Let's say some of this snow is melting, and ice is forming on the tips of some of these branches, and it's making interesting patterns. And you want to explore that. How do you show that in this picture? You can't because it's small, right? But what you can do is pick a little area and make an enlargement of that. We're actually gonna do this before we kind of jump down to the marsh. So what we're going to do is instead of trying to put that detail into this picture, which is just trying to capture the gross big picture of what's going on, we're going to do a little inset um, and that is going to help us. So I'm going to just write in some written notes. Because again, um, anytime you start writing on your page and words are helping do part of the storytelling for you, it's so much easier to, to do what you're doing. So I'm going to just write. Um, any questions you have, like, you know, whose woods these are? I don't know who these woods belong to. Whose woods these are? I don't know. I'm just going to just add some, some, some written notes in there. Um, there we go. 
Now, um, let's say we want to, somebody was asking about there's, there's, there's snow, it's melting, they've got little glistening, sparkly stuff going on in the forest. Um, you can write, you know, the forest, you know, um, forest sparkles with ice. Forest sparkles with ice. The forest sparkles with ice. Ooh, that's seven. All right. The forest sparkles with ice um, after the snowstorm. Um, after the snow storm, the forest sparkles with ice. Um, stars come stars out in daytime stars out in stars out in the day hey a little haiku right so um if i'm wondering how can i show that this forest is sparkling with all these little ice reflections and I have a hard time putting that in my drawing, I can write that in. And if I wanna have even more fun, here's my five, seven syllables, five syllables. I put it in a little haiku. So why? Because you can. <laughs> um, and you just want to, to, to sort of make it your own and have fun with it. Well, let's check out that little branch that comes down um, because the, there's a little branch, that little twig, and the twig has um, ice starting to form in little icicles on the bottom of it, but there's still some snow that is up on the top part of the branch. So I'm just lightly sketching that in with a pale pencil. Um, and... So there is some uh, snow that is up on top of my branch. Always interests me how snow can just sort of pile up all those little snowflakes. So we'll just kind of delicately come down and now into the ice here, I'm gonna kind of just make this part of the twig a little bit more pale. And because down here, this is where my ice is forming. And I'm just going to, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. I'm going to put a little, just a little squiggle down in here to be some darks kind of reflecting in the ice there. So here's snow. <clears throat> there we go. And this is, I always love to break the box so that icicle sticks out of it. And you can also sometimes on your box, sometimes it's just fun to have them be a little bit irregular shaped like that. There's a couple of little chews out of the side of that box. Snow and ice. I can leave it. That if this were done with a ball, uh, ballpoint pen, I could leave it as a black and white ballpoint pen here. Um, if I am doing watercolor, I would probably just put a little bit of shadow in there. I would put a little bit of purple in there. And I'm done. If I really am into it, and why don't I? I can also make the stuff in the background darker. I want that snow to pop out. Again, it's that contrast, light against dark, dark against light. That is what is going to make your 
snow feel bright? The snow feels bright because there's something dark next to it. Just to prove that to you even more, look at this. I'm gonna make this darker, darker, and look at how that makes the snow brighter. So you see these little kind of treasures that you find on your snowy journey. With these landscape ethos, you can doop, 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 just be able to drop them in. Now we finally arrive out there at the marsh. And uh, sorry, Brian, we, we do not, we're not having time here for any other uh, questions. I think we're gonna spend the whole time with all these little winter elements. That's all right. That's the way it goes. Would you ever add um, any quantitative data, like the distance of the valleys, or you know, how large is this valley? And then when you zoom in, like, what's the distance of this? I walk three miles in this forest before coming to another clearing. Or as you're zooming in here and doing these studies, would you? That that's a great. Uh, it's a great thought. It depends on. It all depends on what is kind of attracting you. What are your your interests? We've talked a lot about how we've got words and pictures and numbers. And, um, you know the, uh, the, having those numbers in there, they can be distances. Um, you know, if this is about one mile away, um, out there to the other side of the valley. You know, I can, um, let's see, I can even put in a little arrow going out that way. Robert Frost also gave us the date that this is happening on. Oh, good, good, good. He said it's the darkest evening of the year. Perhaps that's the solstice, the winter solstice. Um, that's great. So, um, We've got this. This is this is our solstice, right? This is on our solstice, our winter solstice. So this is our. That's wonderful. Winter. Winter solstice. We're in Hope Valley. Ah. Oh. oh, that's fun. Um. Now let's see here. Um, oh yeah, the marsh, the marsh. Let's, <laughs> I think the marsh is what got us started. But we had to go all the way to get to that marsh. So that's why um, here. So, but now we're finally out there at the marsh. And I'm gonna do another format of a landscape. Ito. This one, you say like, oh, now you're making this really long thing, but this one's gonna be long and narrow. So I still don't have that much to, 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 to do, right? I don't want to overload myself by, by making this, this, this too difficult. So I'm going to make this a long skinny. Vea, one when I'm close out here, it might be fun to to read that poem. Would you um, cue it up? Would you be able to read it to us? Yes, I would. Um, I'm. I think I've. I'm. I used to have that committed to memory, but I. The. Uh, I'm. I'm pretty sure that parts of it are slipping. Um. So this time, um. There are there are some areas of 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 marsh here. Um, that have cattails in them, and you're sort of seeing out to further sort of areas of cattail, some distant hills, maybe looking uh, across the valley. But these are are, are cattails, and and what I want to do is I want to show people that these are cattails, and it's it's winter now, so they don't have those big full snossage effects. 
So, but there's still some of them that have have a little bit of their 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 fuzz on them. So what I'm doing is just sort of drawing this thing with some wads of kind of matted fuzz. So this was this was one of the stalks. And I'm just bringing this up and crossing it across this whole landscape. Um, and then I'm bringing up maybe like one of the leaves. And what's going to happen then is people will see this is remember how I just put in these words up here that said snow, right? And so it looks like snow. Um, what I'm doing is I'm putting a cattail in the foreground here to show people that this whole kind of mat of stuff out here, these are cattails. They're all kind of broken down. A few places there's a few of those little sticks kind of sticking up. But most of them are kind of sort of broken down by the storms. Um, but if I have this cattail that is sitting in front of all of them, then there's a chance that people will look at this and go like, oh, those are cattails. Those are cattails and they're all matted down. How do I know that? Because you drew a big cattail across the front of them. Again, what I'm doing is just sort of suggesting to the viewer what it is that they're looking at. And then there's on the far side, uh, there's, there's an area of, of, of ice out here. And you know how snow falls on the ice and there'll be some patches where there's still some water through it. So very often that looks like really dark spots in the middle of the snow field. Oh, this makes me really want to go outside and play. Oh, I remember the outside. That's where we used to go pre-COVID. So here's a distant mountains. Here I'm letting this line be just a little bit broken. <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to put just a hint of some browns into this. Distant hills, I'm often putting um, blues into them because if there's moisture in the air that's going to scatter your blue wavelengths of light a little bit more preferentially. And so that makes distant mountains just a little bit more, more bluey. Put some gray into that sky. And then I think I want this near stuff just to feel like there's some little places where there's some shadows in it. So I'm going to just darken a few little kind of nooks and crannies where a muskrat might want to kind of tuck in. So what I'm doing is putting a little bit of contrast into those foreground things. The muskrat place right there. And 
got some blues here for some of the shadows. And if I look at that and I say to myself, you know, that's not really reading as snow covered ice. And I want people to look at that and say that's snow covered ice. Um, what again is the easiest way to do that? I go. I call it snow covered ice and I put in a little bit of label. And this is last summer's cattail. So there's a little bit of a marsh. And we've got a pretty good record of our adventure. I'm going to make this little arrow go to a fine little point out there. So it's one mile away. Another way that uh, Brian, I could put in um, put in uh, temperatures. Um, is um, I could say that this is 30 degrees, put in the temperature. Um, and just to make that a little bit more fun, I'm going to draw in a little low thermometer. No wind. Um, yeah, unfortunately, here in the States, we're still kind of using Fahrenheit. Um, but uh, so if you are in a part of the world um, where um, you um, have degrees Celsius, you're in a, in a much better place. But we have this, um, the United States can't kind of get its act together to join the rest of the world. Um, but here's here's uh, uh, just a, a little record of our adventure today. Uh, how did that police turn get out there in the snow? But um, oh, oh oh, and then there was the fox trail, the fox trail across here. I just want to put that in. Yeah, why not? Um, some thoughts for wintertime sketching. Should you be lucky to find a, a, a bird, a little Townsend solitaire tucking into one of those trees, you can get out and sketch that. You can sketch the animal tracks that you find, the ice and the snow on the branches. The, you can wander down there by those willows and draw the dormant buds just waiting for the spring. So many things to explore. But the landscapes, I recommend to keep them small. And we've got all these different tricks just to help people understand what we're doing in those landscapes. We kept our values, the value range small. And uh, I hope that those strategies are going to help you as you romp about playing in winter. Vivea, how about a poem? Absolutely. This is. Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask, is there some mistake? The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, 
but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Avea. Bob Frost, everybody. Um, so I want to, to thank you, um, Avea. Also thank you, uh, Brian uh, Higginbotham for, um, for helping support us on this. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to, to, to being with uh, you all again. Let's now what we're going to do is we're going to turn over to our community camp. Um, love to see any um, wintertime sketching that, that you folks have done, any kind of things that have shown up in people's journals. Or if you'd like to share your notes from this workshop and this class, you can do that. Um, or any other um, uh, connections or communications for uh, things that you want to share with our nature journaling community. Um, we're going to make it possible now for you to unmute yourself. And we'll do this uh, for a while recording it um, so we can share this with other people. If you don't want to be recorded, then just turn off your, 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 your video at this point. Um, and, um, but at the end, we'll turn off the recording so people who would like to share but don't feel comfortable being recorded can still participate. Um, so, um, so I'm going to start where I know it's cold. All right. Um, Walters, do you want to show us what's happening in real winter? Um, hold on. I'm going to let's see if we can. Hi. Hey there. I think, yeah, it's unmuted. So I jumped in at the very end. I didn't know that uh, you had like the daylight to you are turning the clock. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, it's OK. It's OK. So um, this was today. Sadly, well, there is a, some little snow, but spring is here. Spring has reached us also. Uh, and it was uh, it was quite warm, well, quite warm. It was plus three in Celsius. So today I went to, we have like a nearby point here with a lighthouse and it, it, uh, the point goes deeper into the sea so the migratory birds come closer to the shore kind of. And this is a long tailed duck and there were literally thousands of them there. That's amazing. So, Oh, look at these. What a cool animal. What a cool animal. That's it, it, it's such a beautiful, such a beautiful duck and the, uh, and the pink beak and uh, it's amazing. And uh, here I was just asking questions. The tail is just so, so enormous. It's what, what kind of what, like, what's the function of that? Because as here it's in flight and it's very it's very thin but long usually ducks have like these more they're more spread out so it helps them to kind of steer uh, while they're flying uh but this may i thought my only solution was that maybe it's for display so when the males are displaying for the females oh dude how does the tail of the female look on these no, there is no tail on the females. That's why I was uh, thinking okay. that the only the males have these. Yeah. So that, that would that would be an observation that would be really consistent with your hypothesis about the long tail for display. Yeah, I thought maybe the females kind of look okay. Now, who has the longest tail? Hmm. Mm -hmm. They like kind of maybe look with the the length of the tail so this i i uh this was the first sketch that i got there i was just so excited to see the ducks and i just sketched it real quick but then after i also looked at the them closely the, the three quarter view long tail duck you've got going on right there uh yeah that is really hard time with the beak like oh, oh, yeah, totally, the, totally. but but i'm so just i'm, I'm so just giving you mad points for, for uh, kind of playing with that three-quarter view. 
Um, a lot of people, because it's challenging, they don't touch it, but you dove right in. This is awesome. Yeah, so I, after looking at them some for some time, I noticed that this wasn't quite accurate and I did how really the color yeah. looks. So it actually, the those here, there are white feathers here, black here, brown here, not black. So I just kind of looked at these and uh, this is a more accurate sketch of them. This is this is a really cool. Oh, and, and look at the head bobbing behavior. The head bobbing. Yeah, it, oh. <laughs> I it was I found very appealing and interesting how there this uh, this uh, cheek that I have that have the brown cheek when they stretch the neck the cheeks but stretches with the neck I in my mind I thought that like the cheek well like the cheek color would always well when it yeah. stretches it would stay with it but it also kind of got longer and stretched so that's just the asking some questions about there's a like the spy or, or y web and uh, here's just a little landscape to show how the birds were migrating over the horizon oh that's so exciting that is so exciting um, yeah, so several things that I really like here. I like the iterative drawings, like you get your first impression of this thing, you put it down on paper, and then you change that and change that and change that. So you're not feeling any pressure on you, I got to get this right, because you know with future drawings, you're going to be able to see more, but get whatever details you can down and then build on that, because then it allows you to like, oh, this is different than I thought it was. And the more we look at these ducks, the more you're going to to pick those up. And I also really like that you're putting in. Yeah. And please, please continue. Uh, uh, I was just saying how, how, how I find it so interesting that when I look closely, I, I, well, I, I drove there um, alone and I just spent two hours there. And there were, of course, and in the beginning, I'm still a big bird watcher. I uh, took a checklist of everything I saw. I saw different kinds of duck, ducks, many, and uh, some buntings were there and everything. But then I kind of pulled the journal out and started sketching the most interesting thing and uh, the most that ma made me wonder. So this was this uh, duck how uh, it was. So I was just looking it for a very long time and never noticed that it had like these white feathers on its back. So very, the journal is a great tool to look closer. It is, because we, we actually don't see those things unless the journal slows us down and makes us look like that. Because we once your brain says, oh no, yeah, Walters, you know how this looks, This you're fine, um, go on to the next thing. But you then slow down and you spend more time with that. And all these other discoveries um, come out. And also, I like the way you are uh, documenting the surprise, that stretch of the, the cheek patch. You mentioned that, like in your head, like if you made up how this duck is going to look with different postures, it would look this different way. But you notice that reality is different than, your, than the model in your head. And by putting down these new observations in your journal, you're iteratively changing the mental model that you have to something that is increasingly close to reality. And that that's that's awesome. Um, Avea or, or Brian, did either of you want to um, share any comments or thoughts? I was going to agree that I really, really enjoy the diagrams and all of the questions. Um, and, and it just it, it just gives me this impression that you look at things from different angles and, and that you really, really like you're just very well rounded in 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 how you think about these subjects, and it's really really a delight to see. I wish I could speak. I wish I could speak the language so that I could like read all of your notes because it looks like a really really fun page. Yeah, cool YWeb going on there. Again, yeah. For like some people in the group here don't know what YWebs are. Do you want to kind of break that down for them? What's kind of going on in your brain? I mm -hmm. well, yeah. I just uh, well. I usually start with the main question 
that I have like uh, here is a question. Oh, here is the question about why do the ducks have the, such the long tails? So I start with the main question and I kind of put a big question marks because that's the okay, like kind of a, how do you say, like the center, like the center, like something mm -hmm. that's that earth has in the middle that's rotating. The core, the core. I call it like that, the core. Yeah, that's the core question. Yeah, and then with streaks, I just, I just, uh, form more questions and to those streaks I whatever comes in my mind I wrote it down because I'm not going to remember it I write it down mm -hmm. I for here example I from this question I got to another question then from this question I thought of an answer I wrote the answer down then from that answer I went on to another question is it true and then just these Y webs and then a couple of more questions, a little bit uh, not that so important, but around the subject. And then, mm, like for example, where do they nest? Well, it's a where do they nest? So I wrote it uh, in a bot botany gull. It's a, a gulf gulf that we have uh, here in the Baltic Sea, uh, in Norwegian fjords, in uh, Arctic or in Sweden's Archip archipelago, uh, in Sweden's Arch islands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just these Y webs, and it's really interesting. So really important for me that I also write the answers uh, on the Y web, not just the questions. And, uh, and, and something that it's was really fun. Out. I have. I just want to point out that something you did, which I think also shows really crystal clear scientific thinking is that you know you came up with a possible answer for one of your things and then your one of your questions about that later on is like is this answer that i came up is that correct so what humans have a tendency to do is whatever idea kind of comes into their head most easily because it comes into our head easily we tend to think that that must be true and you are actively fighting against that what's called the availability heuristic, the availability of this idea comes to you easily. So we say, oh, that must be it. But you're showing really good sort of scientific thinking, not getting tunnel vision on that and um, being open to other explanations and, 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 and kind of clear yourself that just because this came to me easily as a possible answer, that doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's correct. So uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman yeah. would love the way you think. I, here are just some of the questions that are here in my trail are impossible to answer. I just, it's fun to think of it that way. I, I will probably never get an answer to them, but it's fun to kind of, maybe it's that, maybe it's this, but maybe it's this. So it's very fun to do that. So very, very fun morning was That's this morning. A, that is an amazing morning. That's an amazing morning. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, boy, I wish we had woodpeckers with uh, red lower belly feathers and undertail coverts. That looks like it was fun to draw. This, this is a great spotted woodpecker that we have here. And I was just doing a diagram. It has a very fun technique. So also I noticed that this woodpecker, he shows up in front of my house every autumn and goes away every spring. Hmm. So he's kind of wintering here. And uh, he's just has, a, he's had, he has figured it out how to feed, how to get food in his belly fast. So you can see a little bit, maybe he, uh, well, I didn't draw it uh, intentionally, but he has like a really fat bottom. Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of pines in there you know uh, so he goes to the pine tree he picks up a pine goes to a tree he has a hole in there he tucks the pine into the tree hole and beats it like crazy he takes out the pine goes to the pine tree takes a pine tucks it into the hole beats it so he, he's very fun to watch i can see him right just outside my window but I went to, I went with a spotting scope to see oh, what he was doing closer. Oh, it's fun 
never noticed that he has like these white spots on his primaries. What it was spectacular. It's very, very fun. And thank you, Jack, for recommending the zebra pen is awesome. Is it all, all this, this was just all zebra pen. I did it first with a ballpoint pen and then over with a zebra pen. That, that's the way that I like using the zebra pen too. I first hit it with that ballpoint pen, blocking those shapes, get my little bit of line variation with that. And then I can come in and punch in some of those lines with the zebra pen. Um, and, and then it just, boom, you've got your, that's fine. Hey, thank you so much. That was cool. Yeah. Um, so let's see what else we've got going on. I see um, um, Michael Helm and Ray Bonto and Nicholas. Uh, so uh, Michael, we're first gonna jump to you, then Ray Bonto, then um, uh, Nicholas. And uh, good to see you. Can get my audio working? Yeah. working? Okay. We're in retreat in a new place called San Juan Island, new place to us, up by the Canadian border. And yesterday we had an introduction to the local wildlife. I don't know how well this is going. Oh. So yesterday we were looking out at this valley called San Juan Valley. And there's some critters out here. And lots of stuff has filled up these little ponds. And there's a there's a, a cow laying down here with its calf. This this seemed to be filled with cackling geese. Cackling geese. Oh, well, I have a comment about the long-tailed duck. We can see the long-tailed duck in the Bay Area every once in a while. But if you go up to Alaska, you'll see a lot of them. And I think there's some in Wolfville Berry Fork, but I'm not sure if I remember that. Right. Oh, fun. There's a lot of them there. And there are some other some other uh, ducks over here, these guys were probably Canada geese. These are probably the cacklers and some snow geese. Kind of hard to, you know, we're looking at it from a, a, kind of a ways away. And then, you know, I'm trying to figure that out here. And then, then we notice this other thing. It was sitting here in the grass. It's dark and it's got a little white top on it. Oh boy. Field glasses and our binoculars and staring at it and trying to figure out what the heck this is. Well, it's a bald eagle. It's oh. a bald eagle sitting in the grass, just kind of looking around, enjoying life, I guess. And this this little pastoral scene went on for about a half an hour. The bald eagle sitting there, occasionally turning its head. And the cow is sitting there with her calf on the side of this little hillock by this bush, by this little stream. There's tons and tons of geese. And you know, geese are nice, quiet animals. They don't make a lot of noise. You don't really, you hardly even notice them. Until. So it's like, ah, 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 it's all this shouting and geese honking and stuff going on. And so, I'm kind of looking, everybody else here is looking real closely at this scene. I'm looking around because I'm such a smart guy. I think I'm so smart. <laughs> Find the other bald eagle. We uh, found the other bald eagle sitting on this snag over here. It looks bigger. I think that was the girl. I think that was Mrs. Bald Eagle sitting over there. That's right. Females are larger. Wow. Oh, what a great collection of landscapitos mixed with. Uh, details of um, the sort of the, the the bird sightings here. This is a really terrific way to record data, and um, and I also like that you're you're drawing things at the level of resolution that you can see them. A lot of people think that they have to, you know, get even closer than they are, and but uh, you know if something is a speck. In the field, we can draw it as a speck with a line pointing to it and saying, Bald Eagle, you know. Uh, are you ready for what's next? Oh, bring it. Okay, we got we, we got some stuff going on. Well, this is Bald Eagle, decides that it's time to make a move, and she flies over towards the ponds. 